Hello and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. I'm Gareth Vaughan from interest.co.nz. In this episode, I'm joined by Stephen Jacoby, who is the Executive Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum and also the former Executive Director of the New Zealand, China and New Zealand United States or US Councils. Stephen's joined us to talk about New Zealand's trade relationship with China. Welcome, Stephen, and thanks for joining us. Kia ora, Gareth. Good to be here. Yeah, appreciate your time. Um, I thought a good starting point would be looking at just how significant New Zealand's trade relationship with China is these days. And you're you're probably uh, as good a person as anyone to talk to about this with all your your vast experience in in trade. So could you give, give us a rundown of just how significant China is as a market for our exports? And I guess here I'm looking at also, you know, some of the key um, individual products or exports, um, and also, um, I guess you know how this has really kicked on since the free trade agreement back in two thousand and eight, and then maybe if you could also just touch on how big a source of imports um, China is for us too, because that's mm. the other side of it. Mm. Well, yeah, and thank you very much uh, again for the opportunity. And you're absolutely right to pinpoint the free trade agreement. Uh, that entered into force in 2008. That has been a game changer uh, for the New Zealand economy. And it has stood us in incredibly good stead, both firstly through the the global financial crisis and latterly through COVID. Because during both of those uh, tumultuous um, times, uh, trade with China really has upheld uh, the New Zealand economy. And it has been a, a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, But yes, the China relationship, the economic relationship, well, it's big. It's very big. There's no way getting around that. Um, It's about 32% of our global exports. That's up from about 12% a a decade ago. Um, Primary products clearly are our largest export item. Um, Exports to China of primary products um, are greater than exports to the other six largest markets combined. You're talking about a very significant slice of New Zealand's external economic activity. 41% of dairy exports, 37% of meat exports, 55% of wood exports, not to mention 90% or something like that for crayfish. Um, You know, why is that? I mean, there's the FTA, clearly, that gives us excellent market access. There are still some restrictions on our exports of milk powder, but they're going to come off in 2024, and then the market will be completely open to us. Um, There's the size of China's middle class that wants to buy the sorts of products that we have to sell. It's particularly true in the agri-food area. And then there's China's development needs, which is fueling construction, uh, and that explains Um, our exports of of wood products. So um, however you look at it, uh, China has become an indispensable partner for New Zealand. But don't forget, some other countries have much larger degrees of export concentration on China than we do. Taiwan is one of them. Uh, Australia, ironically, is another. And so does our great uh, competitor, Chile. So we're not alone. And I think there's another point I want to get across, which is, um, while China is big, very big, uh, it's worth bearing in mind, too, that the the 10 members of the uh, CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a veritable mouthful of a trade agreement, (laughs) that that TPP that was so controversial, you you remember, when it was first signed, exports to the CPTPP partners are even bigger than exports to China. So um, we need to keep these things uh, in perspective, I think. Uh, You mentioned imports. Yes, China's a major import source uh, for New Zealand, of course. Um, And, uh, you know, that just follows the scale of industrialisation that's taken place in China uh, over time. Uh, So, yeah, Gareth, it's big. It's big. (laughs) It's, it's, It's bigger than big. Yes, that's that's great. Stephen, thanks for that. I guess, you know, to some degree, perhaps there's a bit of a natural alignment for each other's products. Is that, I mean, this is Keith Woodford, who um, you you, you may know of, as he's the the former um, professor at... uh, Yes, I do know. Yeah, at Mm. Lincoln University Mm. and now a a consultant at Agri-Food Systems. He he writes for us 
And he made that point in an article he wrote about the natural alignment. And to a degree, that is the case, isn't it? Yes, I think we are very complementary economies. Uh, you know, we're not producing the same things uh, and our needs are quite different uh, and that, that suits us both. It explains why, um, you know, New Zealand exports more to China than China exports to New Zealand, which is quite bizarre. Uh, and um, it's part of this very good success story. But, you know, um, when we talk about this um, degree of dependence on China, I do think we have to keep in mind a range of factors. Um, firstly, the state of the market. Um, well, you know, it's a market that is open and uh, the relationship is favourable. Uh, our, um, our policy settings with China, while under some strain, um, are, are generally positive. But there is a political risk growing of doing business, not just with China, I would say, but around the world. So the state of the market needs to be borne in mind. The state of our product mix needs to be borne in mind. You know, we're heavy with agri-food, as I just mentioned, but within these sectors like dairy and meat, for example, we export a range of differentiated products. It's not one thing to one place. As I think, you know, um, Winston Peters once said, we can't go on um, sending one thing to one place. No, we can't and we don't uh, uh, by any means. We've got to look at the competition. Um, you know, in a few sectors, we have a commanding position like dairy, but, you know, um, in others, there's lots of competition for us. And then there's the question of alternative markets. Are there? Yeah, yeah well, look, they, these are these are great questions and topics, and we'll, 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 we'll move into them um, progressively. Um, look, first of all, you, you did raise the idea of dependence there, and in this, I guess, concept of or question of whether we are over-dependent on China as a export market trade partner has sort of come to the fore in the last couple of years. Um, you have laid out just how significant it is as an export market and trade partner for New Zealand. So what is your take on this idea of over-dependence or dependence? Um, well, I, I'm grateful to um, uh, John Ballingall at Sense Partners who did some very good work for the New Zealand China Council in this area. And he looked extensively at this question, are we over-dependent? What does that even mean? Um, uh, he, he identified four products uh, where the risk might be greater than others. And they were milk and cream, infant formula, crayfish and logs. And each of those four areas, uh, China has plenty of choice about where to buy from. We are not the major um, supplier. They could switch uh, to someone else fairly simply simply, and it would pose us something of a problem to find alternative markets. Um, it would be much harder to find alternative markets for crayfish and logs than it would be for those dairy products, milk and cream and infant formula, notwithstanding the barriers we face to exports of dairy products around the world. Um, so I, I think one needs to, as I was saying, the dependence question is one worth thinking about but needs to be kept you know, in, in perspective. Even if we lost all of those four um, uh, product areas from the relationship with China, uh, we would still have a lot of trade going on. And I think the proof of this um, you know, concept is that uh, even with the problems that Australia has had and the actions China has taken against Australia across a wide range, wine, barley, um, coal, meat, etc., uh, it hasn't really dented. Uh, the growth of Australia's trade with China. So are we dependent on China? Um, I, I think um, to a certain extent, and in some products we are. Uh, are we over-dependent? Um, I personally don't think we are, uh, but I do think the political risks of uh, of doing business anywhere around the world are growing. We might go a bit more into that in yeah, a moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think the risks of the relationship, I think, is... I, I'm not going to use the word unique, but... But certainly they're quite distinctive, um, the risks with the relationship with China for a range of reasons. And I think that's a, probably the next, um, the next issue to get into. So, yeah, there, there, there are, I mean, I guess every trade relationship comes with risks. Um, it's the nature of the world we, we live in, um, whether they be supply, supply chain problems, political issues, whatever it is, weather, whatever, um, these days. 
Um, but it does seem with China that there's probably more than with most other countries, and perhaps this is indeed increasing. Um, I guess firstly, you know, the, the, the big one is that, you know, as China has risen, it's um, been seen more as a, a challenger to the United States as the, in that pre preeminent sort of global position. And that relationship between China and the US, especially in recent years, has got a bit more tense. So as New Zealand is a small, very small trading country, um, being potentially caught in the crosshairs of those tensions between those two superpowers, I guess, is a good place to start on this. And that extends out to the Five Eyes relationship, obviously, that New Zealand's involved in as well. So, you know, let's start with that one. How big of a, of a challenge for New Zealand trade is that China relationship with the US and, and indeed the Five Eyes partners? Yes, well, I, I think you're right to talk about risk and risk management and I think exporters have to manage risks, you know, every day. And they're used to doing it. And some risks are so great that they can't really be quantified. So they, they fall into a sort of category of other <laughs> that, that, that the risk managers um, really don't know what to do about. Um, I asked a, a, a risk manager in a big corporate, you know, how, not that long ago, how do you factor in this sort of political risk? And he sort of said, well, it really is extremely difficult and... Um, Generally, we don't uh, because we cannot make the link between that and the sort of commercial activities that our clients are, have underway. But look, geopolitical risk is certainly growing around the world. And it's because of this game of thrones that's being played by the uh, or between the United States and China. There's no doubt that China is rising, as you said, and it is becoming more assertive on the world stage. China has also changed a lot uh, in recent years. And the United States um, today sees China as, as a strategic competitor, but I think it's a very polite way of describing it. I think it's something more than that. It's becoming almost an existential threat, I would say. Uh, and they are engaged in this, I believe, futile attempt to try to contain China's rise. And you know, I just don't think that was going to work and uh, opposes a number of risks for everybody else, in particular the risk of an accident in the South China Sea is now growing uh, you know, and I th would say is very high right now. And it's often said that, and you know, I think you suggested this, does New Zealand then have to choose between a, a really important economic partner and a really important political and security partner? But I actually question this because I think New Zealand chose a long time ago to be the sort of country that we are. Uh, it chose to be, we have chosen to be, by virtue of our heritage and our history, uh, to be an open liberal market economy. Uh, and that leads us to identify with others around the world that share our values. Uh, and um, I don't think that needs to call into question uh, the relationship with China, uh, where our values may be different. And I don't think it has done uh, to date. It certainly makes the management uh, difficult. And yes, uh, some of those relationships, and you referenced Five Eyes, um, cause us to um, uh, sometimes um, uh, choose to express our views in association with them. Remember, though, that Five Eyes is an intelligence-sharing relationship. It is not a treaty. Uh, you know, Five Eyes of itself does not commit New Zealand to do anything in particular other than share intelligence. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of these things... Um, uh, need to be, again, kept in perspective. It's interesting to see, of course, um, the differences of, of approach being taken by Australia, our close friend and ally, uh, and, uh, and New Zealand about China in recent years. I'd suggest you today they're converging a little more. Now, you know, we have continued to be able to voice our views on issues in China and with China without avoiding a sharp decline in the relationship. That's been a very good thing, I think. That brings me on to the, I guess, the idea of New Zealand having an independent foreign policy, which we often talk about. And that's, I guess, the challenge when you've got, you know, I guess the Five Eyes um, intelligence relationship, as, as, as you say, and the US is there and they're com trying to combat China, however they are, and China, our key trade partner on the other side. It's just that you know, I, I'm just curious, can we re retain, are you, are you confident we can retain that independent foreign policy 
um, and, and indeed that, that there's a will in New Zealand to do so. Well, I'm not pretending that's simple. Uh, <laughs> it certainly isn't. And um, it is becoming more difficult, as I've been saying. I think there's a difference between independence and interdependence that we really have to understand here. Independence and an independent foreign policy means the big foreign policy decisions are made in Wellington, not in Washington, not in Canberra, not in Beijing, and not in Brussels. They're made here. Uh, sometimes that means that uh, we see we express our views differently from our partners, our close partners around the world. And, and so what? We are different. We see the world differently. Um, we have different views. But then there's interdependence. And that's a fact of life in the global community today. It means we have to cooperate with others. And as a small uh, country, it's more incumbent on us to do so, uh, where our values and interests coincide, particularly if you want to get any movement on anything important internationally. And um, that's the interdependent world we live in today. And New Zealand has always been a strong player in that, uh, in that team. We've always acted like that as a founder member of the UN, as a key member in the WTO. We should be proud of that. Now, I think our Chinese friends recognise that and they see us as a, absolutely as a member of the Western Alliance, if you want to call it that, even though our alliance relationships are probably restricted just to Australia these days. They see us as a Western democratic nation. Uh, hopefully they see that we have our own voice and our own ability uh, to act. They won't always like what we say and do. Our European friends don't like what we say and do about agricultural trade protectionism either. Um, but that's who we are. That's what makes us tick. Another aspect to this is China's growing influence in the South Pacific, which has been highlighted this year by a security agreement with the Solomon Islands. I mean, this is obviously an area that New Zealand we've always perhaps a bit paternalistically have viewed as our backyard. What, if anything, does this mean for our trade relationship with China? Uh, well, the South Pacific has enormous needs for development, and those needs cannot be, made, be met um, by New Zealand and Australia alone. That is quite clear. Other partners are needed. Um, China is one of those partners. Uh, it has been in the South Pacific for a long time. It's not new. Um, and, uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, we've, we saw over time a withdrawal of our more traditional allies who are coming back to the Pacific. Uh, I think more partners for development in the Pacific is a good idea. And what we've seen, I think, in recent weeks is that in months is that the South Pacific nations are not without agency themselves. They've managed these things reasonably well to date uh, and I think probably will continue uh, to do so. Uh, and I think I don't think it has a lot of implications uh, for New Zealand's trade other than um, to the extent that the Pacific Islands develop um, um, you know, more quickly uh, and have better outcomes and that opens up new markets uh, for New Zealand. But I mean, the primary interest we have in the Pacific is that our neighbourhood uh, is um, peaceful and secure. And I think um, uh, we'll continue to try to um, make that happen. Now, obviously, human rights is a big international issue as well. And China is an authoritarian one-party state at the end of the day, and, and they do cop criticism over their human rights record. Um, obviously, as recently as yesterday, we had the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights um, release a report um, about, uh, I guess, issues mainly in Western China involving the, the Muslim Uyghur population and, you know, um, detentions, torture, all sorts of fairly horrific issues aired in that. Now, um, our foreign minister, Nanaya Mahuta, did come out with a, a statement uh, expressing deep concern about this and also wanting um, China to uphold its international human rights obligations and respond to the concerns and recommendations raised in that UN report. Um, and then, I guess, broadening it out a little bit, we, we saw um, democracy eroded in Hong Kong, and we you know, New Zealand spoke out about that as well. I guess where I'm getting to with this is how do we factor this into our trade relationship with China? Does it influence it? And how principled should we be at the end of the day when, I guess, economically we have a lot on the line and we might see things or hear about things happening in China that we don't like? 
Um, but are we cutting off our nose to spite our face? Is that is that a danger here? Um, well, I think human rights are part of the overall relationship we have with China. You can't separate or put into little boxes different aspects of the relationship. It's all one part. And, you know, it is true that um, the extent to which we, um, with our independent foreign policy, uh, which we just talked about, choose to express our views can have implications. Uh, you may recall a few years ago when John Key went to Beijing and had made some comments about tensions in the um, uh, um, the tensions between um, China and Taiwan. He was greeted by a barrage of of very negative uh, headlines criticizing what he had said. It's not new that we have had these um, issues. I mean, New Zealand has always maintained the right to speak its mind on issues it cares about. It should do. It does. Uh, sometimes we do that on our own. Sometimes we do it with our partners. Sometimes we do both. I suppose it's about how we choose to conduct ourselves. You know, we have always sought to engage with China directly on issues of concern. Uh, sometimes they're willing to, sometimes they're not. We've tried to avoid the megaphone. So our, our, um, our statements tend to be, uh, you know, carefully constructed and diplomatic. I mean, we can't fa- force China to do what it doesn't want to do, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't say uh, what we think. Uh, and the other thing, I suppose, is, and as the Prime Minister has said, our, di- our differences, our very real differences, don't mean that we can't cooperate on other areas that are of interest to us both. I mean, that's how we've managed things so far. But as we've been discussing, this is getting a lot harder. And when you get a report like the one from the UN on Xinjiang, there, New Zealand has no option, in my view, but to make a response. I hope a careful response, uh, but a response nonetheless. And our Chinese friends may not like what we have to say, uh, but that's a, a, a foreign policy and diplomatic challenge we will have to, we will have to work on. Um, there's another element here, and it's a point I try to make when I'm m- meeting with Chinese colleagues, is that if China really wants to be respected in the world, and to assume its rightful place as a leader amongst the nations. I mean, after all, this is a member of the UN Security Council. There's another member of the UN Security Council behaving abominably at the moment. But if China wants to be seen as a responsible member of the global community, it needs to take seriously uh, the way it treats its own citizens. And it needs to respond more positively uh, to criticisms uh, that come from outside. So. We don't quite know how this particular situation is going to end, but New Zealand's going to make its views known, no doubt about it. Another issue I wanted to discuss with you is this concept of deglobalization that has, I guess, gathered steam through the, the COVID pandemic. And this is, I guess, the idea that with the geopolitical tensions between the US and the West more broadly and, and China on the one side, and then, and then also Russia, um, which you, you know, you've noted that with the invasion of Ukraine, the relationship between Russia and particularly Europe has become very strained, major implications for gas supply in Europe and that, but we'll leave that aside. You know, and through COVID, we've had the supply chain problems as well, um, which which continue, perhaps not at the height they were a, a while ago. And this idea that people want to move, perhaps move away from the just-in-time in, in inventory management model. And, and uh, I did pick up on a, a Bloomberg story recently where a lot of big US companies are talking about onshoring, reshoring, nearshoring, sort of looking to, you know, construct manufacturing in the US or nearer rather than necessarily in China. Um, I guess this is part of the geopolitical um, tension. Um, how real a threat do you think this deglobalization um, concept is to a small trading nation like New Zealand? Actually, I heard the other day I... Um uh, a, a colleague talking about moving from just in time to just in case. Yeah. The idea is that you better produce stuff even if you've got no markets because you don't know whether you may be able to uh, fulfil the demand and, or, or you don't know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, it's quite a shift. Mm. I mean, and partly, by the way, and uh, this is because in New Zealand you don't know if you're going to have the people that's going to be able to work in the factory yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> to be able to do this. 
Look, I, I personally think it's a nonsense talking about deglobalization. Uh, I don't see globalization um, in reverse gear. What is globalization? Globalization is the application of, 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 of technology, particularly communications technologies, uh, to um, increase connections uh, between people around the globe through um, uh, trade, through travel, through communications. Of course, there's been a dent um, put into this by COVID, no doubt about it. But I don't really think we're entering a, a phase of deglobalization. Um, it is true, though, that the big economies are turning inwards. I mean, we have this onshoring, friend shoring, and whatever else shoring uh, in the United States. We have, um, you know, America first. Um, we have dual circulation in China, uh, which is a similar sort of idea. We have strategic autonomy. Uh, in Europe and a, a similar idea in India. Um, and we see as a consequence of these, um, you know, policies, a lot more protectionism around the world. Uh, we saw it during COVID. We came through it reasonably well, but it's coming back again. So, you know, um, all of those things are real. Um, but at the same time, you know, we see um, travel picking up, we see trade picking up. Uh, slowly, I'd have to say. Uh, we see new technologies, indeed part of globalization, coming to the fore, uh, particularly in the digital sp space, which are going to be make the exchange of information, data, including data that follows goods as they move through, th through supply chains a lot quicker and a lot smarter. All of these things are still with us. So I'm not sure that we've seen the end of globalization. But again, as we've been saying, the political risks are growing and the world is not in the same place as it was um, even five years ago where it was moving on a, you know, on, on a path to greater integration. You know, I think if we apply that to New Zealand's situation as a small trade-dependent uh, economy in the South Pacific, far away from our trading partners, far away also from a lot of the problems affecting the world, not to say we don't have our own. Um, what does that mean? It means that I, I think that um, our future is still about integration. Our future is still about how we can integrate more in the region around us, which is the Asia-Pacific region, uh, where the big growth has come in the world in the past and it's going to come back in the future. It's an opportunity for us we can't miss. And some of these new technologies that are being deployed, particularly in the trade area, through digitization, are going to assist that, uh, both for the things we sell as traditional exports, but also for the new weightless economy, which doesn't matter where you're located in the world, uh, to be able to grow. So, I mean, I think that uh, there's good and there's bad, uh, but globalisation ain't over yet. We spoke a little bit earlier about the idea of, you know, if, if we do perceive we have a dependence issue with China, then what are the alternative markets for our exports? i uh, be really interested to get your thoughts on that. I mean, where are the opportunities, if they're there, in the world for New Zealand's key exports um, aside from China? Yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, the big question of the day, isn't it? And actually, it's the old question, because the whole story of our trade and trade policy over the last 50 years, you know, if you want to put a date on it, since Britain joined the European community, that story's been about diversification. Uh, and we've been remarkably successful at this, so successful now that we have to diversify, <laughs> some would say, away from our major trading partner. But anyway, let's leave that. Uh, um, um, if you include the FTAs we've just negotiated with the UK and the EU, our coverage of free trade agreements across our trade is around 70%. That's quite a significant um, achievement. Now, FTAs, uh, even though they're called free trade agreements, um, don't actually give us equality of access across all our sectors. And it's a big problem uh, for dairy uh, and for meat, our two largest export sectors. Ironically, as I said earlier, the best FDA we have is with China. The second best FDA we hope we have once it'll be um, uh, um, ratified is with the, with the UK. The one with the EU, um, I'll talk about in a moment, not so much. Um, but even with these FDAs and even with the integration we've got, uh, you know, we still face 
problems for market access for dairy meat and to a certain extent horticulture and fish and other products, wood products around the world. Uh, and um, uh, that's something we have to keep on working on. I mentioned the NZEU FTA. Uh, it's a significant agreement. After all, the EU is 450 million consumers, not to be sneezed at. Um, it's a great outcome for many sectors, but not for dairy and meat. And because they're our largest exports, uh, and of course it's the greatest share of our trade going to China, um, the use of the NZEU FTA as a diversification tool, if you're really into that, is actually not that, is, is strictly limited, I would suggest to you. But there are opportunities. I mentioned the CPTPP partners earlier. Uh, that's an FTA that's really proving its value. Of course, it contains Japan and Canada, other big economies. Uh, and it's got a lot of interest in new people joining. The UK is going to join. So that's got a lot of uh, areas for us. There's more value to be gained in Asia, and in particular in Southeast Asia. And we're upgrading our uh, FTA that we have with Australia, with the ASEAN economies. But Southeast Asia has to be a major focus uh, for New Zealand uh, going forward. Of course, there's the United States and India. Well, we don't have FTAs with either of those. We can forget trying to get one with the United States anytime soon. They're just not interested, nor are they interested in joining CPTPP. It's a shame. They should be. It's a mistake. They shouldn't have left. Um, but we need to do what we can to continue to engage with them. With India, again, they're not interested in an FTA along the lines we would like to to um, negotiate. But I think there is a lot more that can be done short of an FTA. And we need to put a lot more effort in India uh, to build the sort of relationship uh, that we want there. And then there's a range of other small and but useful markets. And again, our friend John Ballingall at Sense Partners uh, has done some research for the International Business Forum about what those markets could be. There is a list of 22 of them. They all have problems associated with them. So the list is not so important as the, as the desire to look beyond what we have now. And that's really important for us because this wave of trade liberalisation, free trade agreements that we started to negotiate, um, you know, 20 years ago, um, is coming to an end. We've knocked off all the ones and more that we could do. The EU is the last big cat off the rank. Of course, there are some others still to finish, uh, but not like that one. Uh, so what's next? And that's a question we have to turn ourselves, our minds to. Um, all this, by the way, presupposes that trade can take place in a glo growing global economy and that trade can move seamlessly around, which is certainly not the case at the moment. Right now, trade's in a really difficult space because of the pandemic, because of inflation, because of the war, because of um, uh, supply chain disruptions, all of these things. Um, but uh, where to with our trade policy? Big topic uh, for the next period. Well, look, Stephen, that's really interesting. I appreciate your time. It's probably a good point to, to wrap it up for today. That's Stephen Jacoby, who's the Executive Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum and the former Executive Director of the New Zealand China and New Zealand US Councils. And I'm Gareth Vaughan at interest.co.nz with another episode of our Of Interest podcast.